The free previews and preview materials displayed in this video were sent to me for free by Wizards of the Coast. Whoa, Christopher Walken here. Did you know this video is sponsored by channel5o.com and if you use the code SPICE at the checkout of cfbevents.com, uh, you can you let them know I sent you. Uh, and this video also it wouldn't be possible without uh, the support from my lovely patrons over at patreon.com. Thank you, and let's let's get away from this. This accent wasn't Christopher Walken for even one moment, was it? Hello, spicy people of the internet. Spice 8 Rack here, aka what is this? A weekly update channel now? Ha ha ha! No, it's definitely not. I'm almost certainly lying in bed at the moment, nursing the near lethal headache that my 24 hour charity livestream has left me with. We raised a total of uh, this amount of money. Oh, the, whoa, look at that. Oh, that's potentially a good number. Woo, thank you to everybody who came and read, came and watched, and came and modded for it. I am probably in a lot of pain. I'm recording this before I even do the thing, by the way. But whilst I'm taking a frankly well-deserved break, I was approached by Wizards of the Coast to preview some of the new cards from Ikoria, Lair of Behemoths. And in true Spice 8 Rack style, I went completely overboard and put in too much effort on a very short deadline. Look, you only get to preview your first cards once. This is really cool for me. Anyway, here is a story from Ikoria. Hashtag sponsored. Maybe, I'm not sure how, if, if, if this is hashtag sponsored, but just in case, yeah. The wind is a soothing whisper, coiling around Draneth's border wall as Luca does his patrols. He looks out upon the clouds, as still as predators waiting to pounce, and takes in a lungful of sky. <sighs> Nothing quite beats it. He murmurs to himself, a private smile creasing his war paint. This isn't the first time he's been on these walls, nor will it be the last, and he wonders if it would be possible to ever grow tired of this view. On a clear day, you can see for miles into the wilderness, the treacherous landscape splayed out like the hide of some great raptor. The plains and jungles are patches sewn onto worn-out armour, and the gemstone mountains in the distance, which would take a week to climb at the best of times, stand smaller than the claws of a squab gnat from here, somehow dwarfed by the man-made spires of Draneth. Luca doesn't know who built this wall or these steeples, but so long as they do the job of protecting the city behind them, he doesn't care. Luca hadn't exactly been enthused by the idea of memorising the names of long-dead architects and artists. It had been the same throughout most of his classes. Everything had either been dull theory from tattered textbooks, or practical lessons in how to descale and gut snap bass. Growing up in a sheltered fishing hamlet will do that to your education. Did you know that there are over 50 bones in a snap bass, and that most of them are sharp enough to pierce your esophagus if they're accidentally ingested? Most regions in Ikoria sing anthems at the start of classes. Gelbrook recited snap bass safety codes. At best, the lessons had bored Luca, and at worst, each hour he spent in class seemed to crawl down his throat and nest in the pit of his belly. Everyone else was getting it. Why wasn't he? What if he wasn't meant to be a fisherman or a cook or a civic mage? What if he never found out what he was supposed to do? A flight of white pigeons breaks through the clouds below him and flutters up and over the battlements, drawing Luca out of his memory. He grins at the graceless birds and notches an arrow in his bow. He'd been stationed here to hunt for monsters, but he's been told the skies have been quiet since Draneth's Millennium Festival. Occasionally, he hears the distant roar or shriek of a beast far below, but these birds are the closest thing to a threat to Draneth he's seen since he got posted here. He follows the fowl with narrowed eyes, imagining them to be a clash of sky raptors travelling in a kill pack. The leader of the pigeons carries a chunk of tree bark in its beak. In his mind, Luca pictures it instead as a helpless farmhand, captured by these great and wicked creatures from beyond the wall. Luca remembers seeing his first monster. Circling above the school grounds, the ill-equipped town guard scrambling to find a defensive position whilst teachers corralled screaming children into shelters. Luca had looked up then, mouth agape, 
As the growling monster had descended towards the school, claws first, eyes mad with rage, he'd never been more terrified, nor more certain of what he wanted to do for the rest of his life. Drop that civilian, beast! Luca bellows, drawing back his bow and aiming sunward. You shall be a threat to Dranith no more! He relaxes his fingers around the horsehair and sends the arrow sailing. The high whistle of wood and iron cuts through the quiet of the border wall like a broken twig in an empty thicket. It climbs up and westward, pushed by the gentle breeze and sails neatly above the head of the leading pigeon. The birds let out indignant squawks and the leader drops its bit of bark and scatters along with the rest of the flock back over the outer side of the wall. And stay out! Luca watches the birds in their skittering retreat, fists on his hips, chest puffed and proud. I, once more, Luca, champion of the meek, have saved our fair civilization from the clutches of the monsters who would... Ugh. He trails off. No one but the wind and the bit of tree bark on the battlement are listening. He's been training to be a hunter ever since he left school, over a decade of gruelling regime, combat trials, survival training. Getting posted to a border city was supposed to be his shot at a life of excitement, and it's been three months of silent winds. Thank the lords the view is as good as it is. If he'd been stationed north where their walls look out onto empty ocean, he'd have lost his mind months ago. Maybe I should have tried harder at fishing he mutters as he wanders to the fallen bit of bark and kneels to pick it up. For a moment, something blocks out the sun. Lucas spins about, another arrow ready to fire, but the skies are as clear as always. He stands up, scanning the surrounding clouds, the edges of their vapour seeming to swirl in the air. Were they doing that before? Has the wind picked up? I swear, if I've started to go mad, I'm- He stops himself, realising that maybe talking to oneself isn't the best method for staving off potential insanity. He turns about, to see if something flew past him over the wall, when there's a flash of feathers to his right. Luca spins, pulling back an arrow, ready to kill, and aims dead at the intruder. It's one of the pigeons from before. It tilts its head as it perches on its precipice, oblivious to how close it just came to becoming a high-velocity kebab. Oh, you dumb bastard. <laughs> Luca chuckles as he lowers the bow. Just then, a shadow shrouds the entire walkway in darkness, and something above him roars. Luca's already sprinting along the battlements as the shape swoops down towards him. He ducks, protected by the narrowness of the walkway as the monster disappears beyond the outside wall. The hunter's mind is racing. How did a beast that size get so close without him seeing it? He should sound the alarm, but the patrols have been sparse due to the lack of action. It'll take at least five minutes for reinforcements to get here. Who knows how deep into Dranith this beast could be by then? He has to try and bring it down and run to the bell if all else fails. He notches an arrow, takes a breath, and stands. It takes less than a second for him to spy the beast. It's at least 15 feet long, not counting the tail which whips about in the air like a wild serpent. Its wingspan is double that, with what looks like two leather boat sails beating in the air about the beast and keeping it aloft. Its orange and white striped fur lies flat on its flanks as it tumbles and soars through the sky, and its teeth and claws are visible even at this distance. Oh, of course. First live monster I've seen since Gelbrook, and it's a damned Patagia tiger! Luca shakes his head and pulls back on the horsehair string. The arrow won't kill unless he hits the beast in the eye, throat, or just below the ribs. Anything else will just aggravate it. But hitting training targets and spooking pigeons is one thing. Taking down a flying tiger whilst your heart is hammering like war drums is proving to be quite the other. Thankfully, the monster seems to be more occupied with pursuing the terrified pigeons more than anything else. Luca breathes, lowering his heart rate steadying his arm, watching the tiger flip about, chasing the birds. It's strange, Luca thinks, watching this gigantic cat helix and somersault without so much as a sound. This one's not like a raptor, it's... One of the pigeons makes a break from the rest of the flight and the tiger shoots after it, ears, tail and wings completely flat and straight, paws out and grasping. It snatches the bird from out of the air and shoots downwards into the cloud bank, only to re-emerge moments later, once again chasing the bird. It's just a cat, Luca murmurs. This isn't a monster to be put down. This tiger has a fierce kind of beauty. 
The tiger's eye catches the archer above and stops dead in the air, only its wings moving. It's just a very bloody big cat. Luca's heart begins to thunder again. He's seen the infirmaries full of green-leafed monster hunters with tears and chunks taken out of them, heard the rumours about the freaks who engage in eluda and befriend monsters. If they don't end up mauled to death for their stupidity, they're dropped into an oubliette for high crimes against the city. And yet, even standing here, with a clean shot at the tiger's eye less than 50 feet away, Luca doesn't fire. Instead, the tiger flies up to meet him, paws up, but claws retracted, and hovers before him as gracefully as you could ever expect a tiger the size of a market stall to hover. Luca's bow is pointed downward as he looks deep into the tiger's eyes. Years of training, of conditioning, fall like feathers from a plucked goose as he reaches up and pets the cat's cheek. Well, hello there. Luca stumbles over his own breathlessness, his brain barely processing that he's still alive. The tiger begins to purr. One of its four massive fangs has been broken at the tip, giving the cat's face a kind of lopsided charm. Its ears are perked and fuzzy, and even through his leather gauntlets, Luca can feel the cat's softness. In the back of his mind, his training is screaming at him to slay the beast whilst he has the chance, but an overwhelming feeling of calm outshines those thuggish thoughts. Luca has been ordered to kill a threat, but he's choosing to make a friend. What's your name then? Luca asks. Tony the Tiger, says the tiger. Never heard of sugar frosted flakes? Thank you for enjoying that little story from Ikoria. It was inspired by these three preview cards that I was sent by Wizards of the Coast and these two story spotlights that I've riffed off of for one and a half thousand words of creative writing. Stick around throughout the credits to see all of the preview materials that inspired the piece in full. And that's right, Bozo. I just tricked you into watching 10 minutes of Magic the Gathering fanfiction that ended in a fucking Frosties gag, and now, to see the goods, you're gonna have to sit through the Patreon credits. You can't ever get this time back, and I am your king! <laughs> I'm the Joker, baby! I'd like to do a massive thank you to all of my $10 patrons, including Adam Gable, Adrian, an alt-right sleeper agent who gives money to communist Spooker Idica, Anthony G. Reap, Austin Clark, Bambi Roper, Basic, Brian Dunn, Chase Beard, Chris DeVos, Corza, Darius Rudeminer, David Vestal, Dolowen, Drew Pierce, Dystopico, Exidian, Erica Hamel, Ethan Abraham, Flame Consumes, Georgi Layubinov, Hoopered Up, In Response I Bolt Myself, Jake Colburn, Jessica Settle, John Solog, Joshua M. Stephan, Kalia Whithart, Keezy Peasy, Kieran Pollard, Curd Ape Apologizer, Kirsten and Gabriel, Lachlan McAllister, Leftist Tech Support, Liliana Vess, Queen of Discard, Lily Lord, Literally a Ghost That Pushes Over Candles, Linnea, Magic Arcanum, Matty O. Tank 1, Megan Kernan, Me, Misty Sun Mew, Mordella Morana, Mr. Skolaton, Ragavar Cavalli, Ross King, Rowan Brown, Sasha Evelyn Francis, Sen, Silent Celine, Sky Johnson, Solace Ike, Stingray, Swan Hunter, the best Swans player in Montreal. I'm glad to see that uh, Patreon has now corrected the glitch it had uh, in the last video where Montreal was spelt with a C and a greater than symbol. That really threw me off uh, when I had to read it out. The Midnight Sun, the Suavest Orange, Velen Beleren, Vittorio Grace, Vladimir Gorvakov, Xenon, and Zoltai, and all of the rest of my wonderful patrons, and all of the rest of you, and also uh, the folks over at Wizards of the Coast for giving a big old fan of this game a little bit of little, little bit of pep and joy in their step during these weird and horrible kind of spooky old times. Thank you all for watching, and as always, stay spicy.